Today, we're starting a new series, and that series is called True to the Core. How don't you hate it when you bite into an apple and there's a rotten spot in it and just kind of ruins the whole thing? And you know that old saying, one bad apple, right? So how do we not be the bad apple? Society in general has grown more and more casual through the years, and uh, because of that, the church has adapted, and it's not all bad. I think it's relaxed. Uh, you don't have to wear a suit and tie anymore to come to church, or you know, you don't have to put on your Sunday best, or if your Sunday best is a great pair of jeans and, and a clean t-shirt, that's cool, especially here, where there's no perfect people allowed. Uh, but I think um, it's attracted more people to the church but like everything, it's a two-edged sword. There's pros and there's cons to being more relaxed. So don't worry, I'm not changing our dress code or anything like that. I just want to talk about the subject of honor. This series is really a series about relationships, but I'm going to hit it from a different angle. Uh, of course, next Sunday, my wife and I, the day before Valentine's, we're going to be up here together and we're going to talk about uh, the power and the importance of our words and our language in relationships of, of every kind, especially in the marriage relationship, but in friendships, in business relationships, the power of our words. And we're going to talk about training your mouth for marriage. But today I want to talk about the word honor. And honor is the soil that healthy relationships grow from. So you got to have a culture of honor. Um, I want to, to, to remind you of something that is of utmost importance. God's kingdom has a culture of honor. So one thing that we say in our staff, in our offices, in our, amongst our volunteers and coaches around here, one of our unwritten core values is honor up, honor down, honor all around. So what does that mean, Pastor Kevin? Well, you know, a lot of cultures, you know, you just give honor up. You give honor to the president. You give honor to the king. You give honor to the to the pastor. Uh, but a lot of times those people don't show honor back down to those people that they are there to serve. So we want to not just, I don't just want you to honor me, I honor you. And but then we also, we honor everybody all around us because we want to have a kingdom culture. And that is a culture of honor. So let me just get started here. When I was a little boy, uh, my dad taught me manners. My mom taught me manners. I remember one time we were going into a grocery store and, my, and Nana said, uh, now we're going in here, you use your best manners. And I said, my manners, where are they? Are they in my pocket? I, didn't, I thought she meant minnows because I was like the fish. And so I, I didn't know what manners were, but she taught me what manners were. And, uh, and a good mom will do that. My dad taught me that when an elder walks into the room, you stand up. And I said, well, why do I stand up? And he goes, well, if there's not a chair, you stand up and you offer them your chair. I said, well, what if there is a chair? And he says, well, you stand up anyway because they might prefer your chair. He goes, well, if they, I said, well, what if they walk into a room and, the, and I offer them my chair and they say, oh, no, thanks. I don't want to sit down. He said, well, you just remain standing as long as they're standing. When they sit down, you can sit down. And if they sit in your chair, you sit somewhere else. Just honor and you know what? We have lost that in our culture today. Listen to this verse in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32. It even talks about this. It says, You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man or of an elderly person. Fear your God, I am the Lord. So to the Lord, this is very important. You know, especially in our society today, we seem to honor and value youthfulness. Now look, I value youthfulness. I, you know, who doesn't want to just stay young as long as possible, right? My wife tells me all the time, I'm very immature for my age. <laughs> I, t I take it as a compliment. But anyway, uh, I mean, hey, I've got some wisdom or gray hair coming on the sides here. And, and I would love nothing more for a miracle to happen and just get a had a brown hair back, you know, instead of uh, having this grave starting to sneak through. Um, you know, I'm starting to see crow's feet and wrinkles on my forehead, and I'm starting to wonder if Botox is not one of the gifts of the Spirit. I don't know, but I, who doesn't want to look young? I want to look young. I want to feel young. I don't want, you know, joints aching and things like that. But here's the thing. Our society values youth, 
But listen, I remember, never forget, I went to a leadership conference where the former CEO of Express was um, sharing some amazing corporate kind of business strategies and things. He's a strong believer, and he was trying to help pastors lead their churches more efficiently and effectively. And he said, don't retire when you're 65 because you think you're old and, you know, they're going to put you out to pasture. He, he, not pasture, but pasture, like an old cow or a horse. He said, you, you, you finally know some stuff. When you're 60, 65, 70, that's when you are at the peak of your wisdom. So if you want to retire, retire. But if you want to keep working, you still have a lot of value to bring. Because let's face it, we appreciate the energy of the youthful crowd. But... Um, they're dumb as rocks. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, no offense to anybody who's, who's young. I mean, we've all been young and dumb at once. And it is possible to be young and smart. But even young and smart people don't have wisdom that the older crowd has. Because here's one way you get wisdom. T-I-M-E. It takes what, everybody? Time. And if you hadn't been around long enough, you don't have much of it. So you can supernaturally have wisdom. God can help you to walk in wisdom. That's when you're led by the Holy Spirit and you do smart things and you don't even know why other than you're just following peace. And that's how young people can walk in wisdom. But my point is, is we want to be a culture of honor, not just honoring old people, but honoring all people. Can I get an amen, somebody? Somebody say honor. Let me share a story with you out of 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 22 tells about the, the chief priest, Eli, and it says that he was very old. And he heard everything his sons did to all of Israel and how they slept with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, these weren't good boys. He, these were preacher kids, man, and they were not behaving. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one, if one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? In other words, he's saying you're not just sinning against people. You're sinning against God himself. Nevertheless, listen to this. They, the sons, did not heed the voice of their father. They did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Now, that doesn't mean that God disabled their hearing because he wanted to kill them. It means that he wanted to kill them because they failed to heed the words of their father. Not even because they did all these sinful things. How many know we've all messed up, right? And some of us worse than others, okay? Uh, if, if you've messed up, raise your hand. Okay, if you're not raising your hand, we'll have an altar call for liars at the end of the service. So we've all messed up. We're all screwed up in our own special way. That's not the issue. The issue is, is they did not honor the words of their father. In other words, they did not give any weight to the words of their dad. When you don't give weight to the words of the wise, you are foolish and you are dishonorable. You ever heard in the military they give both honorable and dishonorable discharges? If you're not able to serve and it's no fault of your own, that's honorable. But if you're not able to serve because of your poor conduct, that's a dishonorable discharge. We don't want any of you dishonorably discharged. We can, we can join the fun and join the family and still be a people of honor. Still be a people that have integrity. Uh, the word, you know, uh, I, I like to go to the chiropractor every now and then. You know, the, they don't like being called a back cracker, but, you know, that's, they crack your back and your neck and all that. Well, what do they do? They check the joints of your, of your neck and your back, and, the, uh, and they, they're checking the integrity of the joint. So if the integrity is compromised, then there's, there needs to be some sort of rehabilitation. Well, if your integrity is compromised... That means you don't function properly like you're supposed to. You aren't 
honest or truthful or you aren't dependable. You know, when you have a, a knee joint that has gone bad, it's not dependable. You can't walk on it until it gets fixed, and that takes a process. So you need to be, we as God's people want to be dependable. If you're writing things down, write that word down. Just say, I am dependable. In other words, you give your word and you keep it. So here's the problem with these boys. Uh, it, they did not heed the voice of their father. They didn't place weight on the words of their superior, of their elder. Um, that's why I jokingly say sometimes as a pastor, God has supernaturally graced me to be the shepherd. I'm, I'm quoting the book of Hebrews to be the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. If I'm your pastor, I am the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. What do shepherds do? They feed the sheep. They lead the sheep. They milk the goats and they run off the wolves. Okay? So, and I oversee your soul, your well-being. I feed you God's word so that your mind can be renewed. Um, what else do I do as, as, as your pastor? I equip you for the work of the ministry. So, if, now that's if I'm your pastor. And like Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And if you're not my sheep, you're not going to listen to me. Oh, yeah, you're my pastor, but I just don't you know, care what you have to say. Well, then you're at, at best you're a goat or you're just in the wrong sheep pen. You need to go somewhere where you can hear and adhere to the voice of your shepherd. So I jokingly say one day I'm going to get a T-shirt made that just says, I told you so. <laughs> if you would have done what I said, you wouldn't be in this mess that you're in. You know, after all these years, how many people I've watched just wreck and ruin their own lives because they would not give weight to the, my words. Not that I think that I'm smarter than everybody or that uh, my opinion of myself is so high and inflated. No, God, I realize I give him glory, but he supernaturally gives me and my staff grace to serve you and to guide you and to feed and lead and help protect you. And so when you don't listen in the main way is when we're here just, you know, studying God's word on Sunday mornings or in small groups. But when you don't listen, you do so at your own, to your own peril. Now, I know that's heavy, but listen, we have to get back to a place where we honor God's word. We honor God's men and women. We honor God. And that's another thing. People say, well, it's not right for women to speak in church. Even the Apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians. Women, it's not, it's, uh, women shouldn't speak in church. All right, first of all, anybody teaching that doesn't know how to properly exegete Scripture. They are not rightly dividing the Word of God. Because in that day, in that culture, the, like in India, the men sit on one side and the women sit on the other side of the church. And Paul was saying, when somebody's up teaching and prophesying and studying God's word because the men from a young age at that, in that culture, in that time, they went through school. The women didn't go to school. They studied scripture and they memorized the first five books of the Bible in that Jewish tradition. And the women did not. And so the preacher would give a reference to something um, and he would do it in such a way, he would give a little one-liner, and with that reference, everyone knew, oh, he's talking about this whole chapter, he's talking about this whole book. And so uh, it was chiastic teaching, and so, but the women didn't have that point of reference. So they would holler out from one side of the sanctuary to the other, Henry, H Henry, what's he talking about? And Paul said, don't do that. You're interrupting everything. Wait till you get home and then ask your questions to your husband. Okay? That's, when he, that's what he meant when he says it's not right for women to speak at church. So if you grew up in a church that doesn't believe in women preachers, you grew up in a church that doesn't fully believe the Bible. <laughs> they say, well, that's harsh. No, it's true. Because you've got a Priscilla and Aquila of a married couple, and they were a power couple, and they were both apostles that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. So anyway, that's just ignorance gone the seed. That's just chauvinism, I guess at best, ignorance, 
in chauvinism. So my point being is that we honor God's word, God's men, and God's women. And when you come to church, you ought to come and supposing that whatever I'm teaching or whoever's teaching or preaching, whether it's my beautiful bride or whether it's a guest minister, you should just suppose, man, if Jesus himself was here, this is what he would want me to hear. That we're preaching by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Put that much weight and honor on God's word as it's being taught. And if you'll do that, if you'll tweak and adjust your attitude when it comes to that, then you'll uh, increase your spiritual horsepower significantly. And here's, my, here's, here's a big takeaway from today's message, okay? Uh, I want you to, to listen to this. Please listen, all right? Hello, are you listening? Everybody say, I'm listening. Thanks. So, there's many issues, unanswered prayer, problems people have, financial shortfalls, physical ailments, just go down the list, and it's all connected to this root of dishonor. If you'll get this right, it'll have a cascade effect and fix so many other issues in people's lives. Okay, I'm going to show you that as we continue studying God's Word. Let's go back to 2 Samuel, and I want to go to verse 26. And it said, the child Samuel, he became the prophet that took uh, Eli's place. He grew physically in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. Why? Now, verse 29, God sent a prophet and reprimanded Eli. And he says, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offerings which I commanded in my dwelling place. And this is the rebuke that the prophet had for the high priest Eli. He says, you honor your sons more than you honor me. Woo, man. Come on, somebody. He says, to, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, the, of my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and, your, and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, says the Lord, in other words, he's saying, I changed my mind because of your conduct. Far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Now, I know this is not a typical message, but we need to hear it. This is kind of maybe some broccoli and cabbage in our diet that we, that we need. Some, some fish oil and all that good stuff that's healthy for you. So he says, those who honor me, or that word honor in, this, in the Hebrew means a weightiness, the kabod, the kabod of God, the weightiness, the heaviness of God. Those who put weight and honor and respect on me and my words, then I will put weight and honor and respect on them. But those who despise me and they don't honor me and my word and my precepts, he goes, then they will be lightly esteemed. Now, if the rest of this story is there was a battle that broke out. Eli's two sons went off to battle and they were both killed in the same day, and when they brought the report back to Eli, I'm so sorry to tell you, sir, both of your sons were killed in the battle. He was so grief-stricken, surprised, he fell back in his chair that he was sitting in, and the Bible says he was a fat man, and he broke his neck when he fell back, and he died as well. His whole family and lineage was wiped out in a day. Why? Dishonor. Now, you don't think God takes this stuff Seriously? The Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. God says, those are my people that I called, that I anointed. And if you're going to complain and gossip, you better do it about somebody else, not them. Right? Okay. So, uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. It says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? That's a good question, isn't it? Who may dwell in your tabernacle? The reason this is important is because God will use a dirty vessel, but he won't inhabit one. Who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And then he says, all right, here's the answer to your question. I'll tell you who can abide in my tabernacle and dwell in my holy hill. Number one, he who walks uprightly. Number two, and works righteousness. Number three, speaks the truth. We're going to talk about lying at the end of this series. I know, you're excited, right? Uh, number four, he who does not backbite with his tongue or gossip. 
How many of you, if they'll talk about somebody to you, they'll talk about you to somebody when you're not around. And then, number five, nor does evil to his neighbor. Number six, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend or get easily offended. Number seven, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. In other words, someone who's evil or living la vida loca, they don't, they don't go, oh, I wish I could live like that. No, they go, no, that, that's, that's not right living. You want to live right. So those seven things. And then number eight, but he who honors those who fears the Lord. So you, not only do you disrespect vile people, you honor people that live holy and right and clean and upright and that walk with God. Those are your heroes. Uh, you know, uh, I know people that if they see a famous person, they get starstruck. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And my wife, she goes, you just don't care about that stuff, do you? We'll see somebody famous. Let's go get our picture made with them. I'm like, I don't want my picture made with them. They're like, why, why don't you care about that stuff? I'm like, man, I've seen Jesus. <laughs> what greater star is there than that guy? I spend time with God. I love people, but I'm not impressed by somebody who's been in a movie or whatever the case may be, who has a bunch of money. My daddy has a city with streets made out of gold. So let's honor, let's give honor to whom honors do, right? All right, so, and then he goes on to say, here's number nine, who can dwell in God's temple? He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Number 10, he who does not put out his money at usury. In other words, you don't lend money and then charge an exorbitant illegal interest rate. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. But he, does these, he who does these things shall never be moved. If you live like this, you'll never be moved. You'll never be shaken. You'll never slip. You'll never fall. Woo, praise God. That's good stuff. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 9. We won't take time to read all of that, but let's listen to this verse. It says, honor the Lord. Well, how do we honor the Lord? He says, do it with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. In other words, the first thing you ought to think about when you get a bonus or a raise or when you get a windfall is, or you sell something and you make money on it, he goes, the first thing you ought to think of is, how can I honor God with a with portion of this? So you have stuff, you have possessions, and God says you can either honor me with your possessions or dishonor me with your possessions. I always use the illustration of people who, uh, they want a boat and they go get one. They believe God for a boat and God blesses them with a boat and then they quit coming to church because they're out on Sundays in their boat. <laughs> well, that's dishonoring to the Lord. You got six other days or you got Sunday evening and afternoon to use your boat. Don't skip church to enjoy because then the blessing becomes a curse. You think, oh, I'm going to spend time with my family. The greatest thing, listen to me, church, the greatest thing you can do for your kids is bring them to church. I didn't say take them to church and drop them off. I said bring them and let them see you placing a priority on God's house and God's people and God's word. and Let them see you worshiping God. You want them to serve God when they're older? You want them to avoid some of the dumb stuff you did when you were a teenager or when you were a young adult? Then let them see you serve the Lord with gladness and use your boat the other six and a half days of the week or your golf clubs or w whatever the case may be. Come on, don't shout me down because I'm preaching good today. You say, oh, I know why you're not here. You couldn't do this in person. <laughs> I wanted to bring this in person. But it's, it's God's word nonetheless. Listen to Proverbs 13 and verse 18. Proverbs 13 and verse 18 says, Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. So when somebody comes to you, whether it's your boss, or whether it's your worship leader, or whether it's your pastor, whether it's your supervisor, your husband, your parents, uh, whoever, when someone comes to you with correction, if you disdain that correction, in other words, if you don't value it and take it to heart, even in criticism, there's a kernel of truth. If you can take that and find it and become better. He who disdains correction, poverty and shame will come to him. Let me give you an example. Um, say, oh, well, you're just, you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. or you're Now listen, if it's, if it's important to your leader, then it should be important to you. 
I'll give you an example. This is a true story. Uh, one of my professors in Bible college, he's now a very well-known and great pastor, Pastor Keith Moore. He tells a story of when he and his wife were at Brother Hagen's house. Now, Brother Hagen's my spiritual grandfather. He's kind of the apostle of the faith movement, word of faith movement, and that was just an amazing man of God. He's in heaven now. But once uh, Pastor Keith and his wife, Phyllis, were at Brother, Brother Hagen's home, and they were swimming in the swimming pool, and they were going to all, the ladies were going to make sandwiches in the kitchen, you know. And, and so Miss Phyllis was slicing a tomato. And now she's a Mississippi girl. She knows how to slice a tomato. And, but Brother Hagen, he said, oh, he said Phyllis, that, that, that's not how you slice a tomato. Here, do it like this. And he, he showed her how to do it a different way. Now she could have been offended and thought, tomato, tomato, what does it matter how you slice the tomato? But here's what she said in her own heart. She goes, well, it's Brother Hagen's tomato. I'll slice it however he wants it sliced. Now that is the right attitude. So if you're in somebody else's home and they do things differently than you do at your house, well, guess what? When you're at your house, you do it like you want to do it. But when you're at their house, you do it like they want to do it. Why? It's their house. When you're in the house of God, we have protocols and we have culture and we do certain things a certain way. And in fact, the Bible says, let all things be done how? Decently and in order. And it might not be how you would do things, but guess what? It's not your tomato. <laughs> All right? So it's my tomato. So we're going to slice it how I want it sliced. Well, that sounds self-serving. No, I just know that one day I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and I will give an account for how this place was run and how I ministered and pastored you. You won't. I will. So if I, you know, want things done a certain way, please do it that way. You know, when, for example, when the guy's out in the parking lot and he's trying to, he, you know, he's smiling, he's waving, he's like, hey, park right here. And you're like, I don't want to park there, I want to park over here. All right, that is rebellion. I love you, but the Bible says rebellion is the same as witchcraft. I say, Pastor, that's harsh. No, I'll tell you what's harsh is for me not to bring it up and for you to get shame and poverty as your inheritance because you disdain correction. Y'all out there? I can't hear you. I'm on, I'm on video. So you're going to have to shout loud today. So poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards or values or honors a rebuke will be honored. Ooh, that, that sounds much better, doesn't it? That's the good news. Proverbs 18, verse 12 this is the book of wisdom, Proverbs 18 and verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and be but before honor is humility. So uh, I remember once when I was at Rhema Bible College, I was, um, I was working out in the gymnasium in our gym that we had there in our rec center on campus. And... I, uh, you know, they have one of those, you know, machines. It's got the plates on it, you know, and you back, back, back exercise, exercise. Well, I was doing that exercise, and it slipped out of my hand, and it, bam, it fell. Well, if those things fall hard enough, you know, it could crack one of those plates. Or, and they were very good stewards of their gear there. And the head instructor of the, the guy that ran the gym, he was actually a former bodybuilder. He's a stud. And he came over to me and he goes, hey, hey. He said, don't do that. Don't drop the weights. Well, I didn't mean to. But instead of saying, I'm, come on, dude, I didn't mean to. Cut me some slack. I said, yes, sir, I apologize. I, I'll, I'll, I'll do better next time. And he went, thank you. Kind of like, wow, that's not usually the response I get. You know why? Because people are knuckleheads. But not you. You're Harvest Church members. You're ch children of the Most High God. You have the culture of honor on the inside of you. So you don't despise rebuke. You take heed to it. And shame and honor is not your portion, but rather honor is headed your way because you have a t humble, teachable spirit. And promotion comes from the Lord, and he promotes the humble. And I'm just telling you, good things are headed your way in Jesus' name. You receive that, somebody? 
Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 3 says, It's honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Anybody can start a fight. But it takes an honorable man to bring a stop to strife. Um, I know of two brothers in our church that got a little sideways with each other a couple of weeks ago and over a, just a misunderstanding, but both of them had humble hearts and attitudes, kingdom hearts and attitudes. And uh, I like especially what one of them said. He goes, I don't want to be uh, uh, offended or in strife with somebody that I'm going to spend eternity with. That's the right attitude. That's the kingdom of God. And God blesses and honors that. Because uh, any fool can start a quarrel, but an honorable man, honorable man stops striving. And you are honorable people. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. And it says, this is God talking here. He says, a son honors his father, and a servant honors his master. God says, if I am the father, where's my honor? And if I am a master, where's my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who have despised my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Now, do you see the tone of their voice there? They're like, they're questioning God. You say we haven't honored your name. How have we not honored your name? What are they doing? They're arguing with God. Now, on a scale from 1 to 10, how dumb is that? It's about an 11. (laughs) Why? Because how many know God's right? God's right. If you disagree with uh, the Scripture, um, you're wrong. Because God's word is true. It's forever settled in heaven. And if I agreed with you, then we'd both be wrong. So, no, if God says something, then what's the right answer? Yes, sir. I'll work on that. I apologize. I, please forgive me. That's the right attitude. Now, let's go skip over to Malachi chapter 3 because God's just having a, a conversation with these same people. Now, you've heard these verses before if you've been in church for very long, but I want you to hear it from a little different angle. This is about tithing, but I want, you to, I want to point out something different to you. He says in verse 8, Malachi 3, 8, Will a man rob God? Yet yeah, you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Come on, God. We had not robbed you. What are you talking about? Guess what? If God says you've robbed him, he's right. You don't argue with God because he's right. And God answered their question, though, and he told them in what way they had robbed him. And he said, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. Because that's why you've got all these problems. You haven't honored me with your tithe. Now, tithe, not ties, like a necktie, but tithe, T-I-T-H-E, it's a Hebrew word that means a tenth. In other words, God had asked them to give him a tenth of all of their possessions, of everything, a tenth of everything, income, increase, properties, revenues, percentage earned, all those things. He said, give me a tenth, and they stopped doing that, and they were having problems and God says, it's, it come, and it wasn't about the tithe or the money. It was about the dishonor. And God says, he gave him an instruction. You've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes, the 10%, into the storehouse. Why? That there may be food in my house. And try me in this. God's saying, now listen, test me and just see if what I'm telling you won't work. This is the only place where God invites us to test him. And it's in the area of honor honoring God with our finances. He says, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you. Ooh, I like that. Everybody say pour out. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like our word for the year, overflow. You want overflow? You do your part. God will do his part. He says, see if I will not pour out for you such a blessing. Now, if you've got your Bible there in front of you, underline or draw a box around that phrase or highlight that phrase, such a blessing. If you're just taking notes, just write it down, type it in the, in the, in the chat, in the comments, such a blessing. God has such a blessing for you, such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And, and wait, there's more. If you act now, there's a bonus. He goes, and I will rebuke the devil, the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful lamb, says the Lord of hosts. 
Such a blessing. What does that mean? It doesn't, you know, what's the blessing of the Lord? A blessing of the Lord, the word blessed or blessing means empowered to excel and prosper. Empowered to excel and prosper. You know why some of you are not excelling and prospering in your finances? is because you don't honor God with 10% of your income and your increase. You know why some of you are not excelling in your career? It's because you don't honor God with the first portion of your talent. You give it all to the world. You know why some of you never seem to have enough time? You're so busy. You're stressed out. You don't have any margin. It's because you don't give God and honor Him with your time. You have three major resources, your time, your talent, and your treasure. And if you'll honor God with that, He will bless your time, your talent, and your treasure. What do you mean bless? He will cause it to excel and prosper. Ooh, man, we just solved a problem for somebody. But you gotta do your part, right? Two-sided coin, remember? God's side and your side. Now, let's go to the New Testament now. In our Daniel fast, we read through the book of Romans, and if you haven't finished it yet, that's okay. Just keep going. Keep, keep reading. Uh, I love, you know, uh, before some of these major universities like Harvard backslid, they would study the book of Romans when they're law school because it was such an airtight, perfectly written manifesto. So Romans chapter 12 in verse 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. In honor, giving preference to one another. So one way we show honor is by giving preference. What do you mean preference? Well, you go with what they prefer rather than what you prefer. What they want rather than what you want. You make, you make their desires more important than your own. So, in other words, the current money paid is what the word honor means. Honor... In other words, pay by giving preference. Let honor be the currency that you use in relationships. Ooh, that's good. Let honor be the currency that you use in relationships. Relationships that you value and that you want to grow and prosper. Let's go to Romans 13, verse 7. Romans 13, 7, it says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs or tolls to whom customs are due. So, don't try to cheat the toll booth. Don't try to cheat on your taxes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar. Why? Because it's honorable. Fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor. The message translation says, that's also why you pay taxes, so that an orderly way of life can be maintained. Fulfill your obligation as a citizen. Pay your taxes, pay your bills, respect your leaders. Pay your taxes, pay your bills, respect your leaders. Um, don't just pile up a bunch of debt and then file bankruptcy. It's not honorable. It's not honorable. Well, I can't pay. Well, you tell them, listen, I'm not going to file bankruptcy. I'll pay you what I owe you. It might, and just start sending them 20 bucks a month. Well, that wouldn't do anything. Well, it's a, it's a sign of good faith that I have intentions of keeping my word and doing what I said. You pay what's owed. You pay what's owed. Now, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 6, 1, I'm just going to read verse 1. It says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Well, what's the promise? The promise is that if you will honor your father and mother, it says, the Bible says, you will live long on the earth and it will go well with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if it doesn't go well, I don't know if I want to live long. But he says, if you will honor your parents, you will live long and it will go well with you on the earth. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I live a blessed life. Now, we've had struggles like everybody, but I'm telling you, we are in a good place. Things are going well. I have a great marriage. I have great kids. We have, we've downsized our house. It was a downsize with an upgrade. We just are blessed. In so many, we have good health, nothing to complain about, but I'm convinced it's because my wife and I, we honor our parents and they honored their parents so think of the Japanese the as a culture they have more centurions or people that live to a hundred and beyond 
than any other culture on the planet. Well, they've taken honoring their parents to an extreme, and they have, it's wrong, but they've taken this principle to an extreme, and they have ancestral worship. They worship their parents, and they worship their grand- grandparents and their great-great-grandparents. They worship their ancestors. But you know what? It's a principle, and if you will apply, I'm not saying you should worship your parents, but you should honor them, and if you will, it will go well with you, and you'll, and you'll extend your lifespan, your life expectancy. 1 Timothy 5.17, and I'm almost finished. 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule or lead or serve well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So he's writing to Timothy, who's a pastor, and he says, hey, If you and the elders rule, lead, and serve well, especially in the Word of God and doctrine, then you should be counted worthy of double honor. And that word honor is literally the word for compensation, for pay. So he says, whatever the going rate is, double it. (laughs) You know, people get upset that preachers are paid well, but a lot of ministers are not paid well enough. I am, I'm not saying this for my benefit, I'm blessed. When I first started pastoring here, they got me at a bargain. You know what I'm saying? I came at a discounted rate. But over the years, as our church has gotten healthier, we're fine, we're blessed. So I'm not saying this for my benefit, but I'm just telling you, our mindset needs to be that we don't need to despise or, or you know, the old saying, well, you know, uh, Lord, you keep the preacher humble and we'll keep him poor. Well, that's just demonic, And so if you're watching this and you attend another church, you should lobby to get your pastor blessed and get him paid what he ought to be being paid. And so and we want to pay our staff well. We want to to take care of the people that help us take care of you, right? So this is our life calling. And the Bible says, let those who labor and serve well and rule well be counted worthy of double honor, all right? Just say amen anyway, all right? Now, let's get, how does this apply to our relationships and to our marriages? The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, and I got a couple more verses and we'll be done. Hebrews 13, 4, it says marriage is honorable. Well, that's a good report right there, isn't it? In other words, God says marriage is honorable among all. What do you mean among all? Um, well, the Bible defines marriage as uh, a lifelong commitment between one woman and one man that were born as such. So in that context and using that definition, he says marriage is honorable among all, meaning that it's okay if you marry someone of a different ethnicity, if you marry someone that is uh, you know, from a different culture. God's like, marriage, he goes, I esteem marriage. God, you know, marriage was God's idea. It wasn't a lawyer's idea. It was, it was God's idea. And he says it's good. So marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled or pure however fornicators and adulterers god will judge why there's no honor in it what's a fornicator somebody that's not married that has sex with somebody or everybody an adulterer that's somebody who is married but they have sex with somebody they're not married to and the bible says god will judge that god will judge it so but when you're married he even brings up the marriage bed And God says, when married people do what married people do in their bed, that's honorable. God says, that's good. So, (laughs) I mean, marriage is a good idea, everybody. And people now are getting married later and later in life or not getting married at all. They're, They're cohabitating, but they're not getting married. That's not honorable. What's honorable is marriage. And let me just tell you, I've been happily married for over 28 years. I've been, let me rephrase, I've been happily married for over 26 years. 26 out of 28 ain't bad. So I'm not saying that everything's perfect and everything's always a bed of roses. We've had our struggles, but thank God because Christ is the center of our relationship and my wife's my best friend. And, and, but she's also my lover and she's also um, the baby mama. She's also the mother of my children and she's my uh, co-equal. She is my... Um, uh, confidant. She is my colleague. We work together. So she's awesome. She's, she's my lover. And 
Marriage is awesome. I would do it all over again. If, if, we, if we could or had to, I would say, yep, I would marry that girl again. So marriage is wonderful. And by the way, Valentine's Day is coming up, fellas, so make preparations for that. A uh, little heads up, a little hint, you're welcome. But marriage is honorable among all. Now, when you sleep with someone you're not married to, you are dishonoring yourself. You're disrespecting yourself. You're cheapening yourself, not to mention your current or your future spouse. So let me just tell you, you are better than that. You're worth more than that. And if you've messed up, then just fess up and let God pick you up and move forward because your future is bright. And it's not about what you've done. It's about what Jesus has done. That doesn't give us a license to sin. It gives us a license to live free from sin. And that's the good news, everybody. That's the good news. Let's look at 1 Peter 2, verse 7. Two more verses. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, in that day, they may have been like, the king? I don't like that guy. How many know you honor the office? Um, I'm not uh, always fond of whoever our president is, but I, I don't speak negatively of them because of the office that they stand in. All right? And in today's current culture, there's lots of division and opportunity for people to speak negatively against political figures. But if you aren't happy with them, the Bible says pray for those that are in authority. It doesn't say gossip or slander them. It says pray for them. So listen, we may all need to do a little repenting about this because if you have spoken negatively about our president or about Supreme Court justices or about congressmen or women, then we need to repent and we need to covenant in our heart that we're going to do what the Bible says and we're going to pray for those in authority. We're not going to slander them or talk negatively about them. Okay? Amen or oh my. <laughs> Let's be a people of honor because the honor is the soil that healthy relationships grow from. And finally, 1 Peter 3, 7. 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands. Likewise, dwell with your wives with understanding. Now, how many know it must be possible? <laughs> dwell with your wives according to understanding, giving honor to the wife. Husbands, the Bible tells us to give honor to our wife. Uh, you know, back up where it says marriage is honorable, um, that, one, that word honorable in that passage means costly. Marriage is costly. It's an investment. Um, or like one guy, he goes, he goes, preacher, you think marriage is costly? You should try divorce. <laughs> now, it's not the same word. It's not the same kind of costly there. So, and, and yes, if you want to avoid a costly divorce, then give honor to your wife. And maybe you are thinking, well, my wife's not honorable. Or my wife is crazy. Or my wife can get on my nerves. Listen. It, the Bible doesn't mention any of that. It just tells us what we need to do. We need to love our wives as Christ loves the church, and we need to give them honor. Now, give means it's free. You give it to them. You give them honor. In other words, you treat them as if they, as if they are precious, costly, expensive. They probably are expensive. and That's okay. They should be. You know, romance equals finance. You know what I'm saying? So, but we need to honor them, the Bible says, as to the weaker vessel. Now, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't say that they are weaker. It just says, honor them as if they're the weaker vessel. Now, stereotypically, men are physically stronger than women, stereotypically. There's exceptions, right? However, he's not, but, but psychologically, they're tough. And if you want to talk about physical strength, I was in the room when my wife had both of our babies. She's strong, physically and mentally. I couldn't do that. You ever heard of a man cold? I mean, we're out for a week, right? So <laughs> women are tough. When I was in the room with our second child being born, we had a, a female doctor. And when I was in the room, I, I said, I didn't realize I said it out loud, but I said, thank God I'm not a woman. And the, my wife, the nurse, the doctor, they all looked at me like, what did you say? And the Lord helped me. I caught, caught it. And I said, I said, thank God I'm not a woman. And I said, because I'm not tough enough. 
And they were like, that's right, buddy. That's right. <laughs> and it's true, man. Woo. My respect level went way up after childbirth. So husbands, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. You know why maybe God doesn't answer some of your prayers? It's because you're dishonoring to your wife. Maybe. Not saying that's the case, but that's a possibility. If you watch pornography, you're not only dishonoring God, you're dishonoring your wife. Dishonoring yourself. If you don't have a job and you're able to work, now, if you're not able, I understand there's extenuating circumstances. But if you're not providing for your wife and your family, you're dishonoring your wife and your family. Hello. Now, if your wife, if she's got a different education and she makes more money than you, that's, that's cool. I mean, good for you. Uh, got, got you a sugar mama. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But do your part. Carry the weight. My wife's not the only one who washes dishes at our house. It's her, it's me, and it's Nana. <laughs> God bless Nana. <laughs> Takes a village, right? Man, I don't know about y'all, but we invest in paper plates at my house because I don't like washing dishes. Now, I'm just telling you, honor could be the solution to many of your problems. If you honor your wife, if there's honor in your marriage, guess what? Your prayers, the possibility, the probability, rather, of your prayers getting answered goes way up just from giving honor where honors do. Man, I hope this helped you today. We want your relationships to be healthy and strong and vibrant and bearing much fruit and happy and healthy. So it grows out of the soil of honor. Now, weeds can grow out of, that, out of soil, but not out of the soil of honor. And we're going to talk about some of those weeds, how to get those uh, out as well. But to whom do you owe honor? That's my question I want to leave you with today. To whom do you owe honor? Is it those in leadership of our nation? Is it those in leadership in our church? Is it those in leadership in our city, at your job? Is it your spouse? The Bible does tell wives to honor and respect their husbands. Well, he's not respectable. Doesn't matter. You unconditionally respect him just like he's supposed to unconditionally love you because sometimes you ain't lovable. But we're supposed to love you anyway, right? So we all have a part to play. And thank God, when one, in my marriage, when one of us is weak, the other one's strong. If we ever got discouraged on the same day, woo, it'd be bad. But we, when one's weak, the other one picks the other one up. We encourage each other. When I'm weak, she honors and respects me. When she's weak, I love her. And that's how relationships flourish. Amen? Speaking of flourish, ladies, you're having a great uh, ladies' night coming up in March so we'll start getting ready for that. Lots of good things, lots of good things are coming. Um, in a couple of weeks, two weeks from today, Pastor Mark Hankins is going to be here. You don't want to miss it. Bring somebody. It's going to be a wild, awesome, awesome Sunday in a couple of weeks. You don't want to miss that. Now, before we go, I want to lead us in the prayer of salvation. So if you're in the room and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you're watching us online today and you need to get some things right, maybe you need to repent of some dishonor in your heart, or maybe you just need to honor the Lord by making Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to lead you in a prayer today. Let's all pray this together. Online, in the house, let's all say it together right now. Come on, everybody, say it out loud. Pray this with me. Say, Dear God, I repent for being dishonorable in any area of my life. I repent for showing dishonor to teachers, bosses, pastors, political leaders, policemen. I repent of dishonor. And I believe if I walk in honor, you will honor me. And now, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life, from this moment forward, I'm a Christ follower. I may not be perfect, but I'm perfectly God's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friend, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. And if you dealt with some dishonor in your life, man, good on you. I believe things are looking up for you in every way in Jesus' name.